hand over to Wesley uh, on behalf of the Ulster Farmers Union. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, again, we appreciate the opportunity to be down here today to talk to you, and thank you very much for the invitation to do so. And can I apologise at the outset for my present Barclay Bell being otherwise engaged today, otherwise he himself would have been down here, so unfortunately you have to put up with me in the meantime. And I, uh, I suppose uh, I would like to just cut the chase in terms of Brexit, where are we now, and then go back and revis revisit some of the issues. And I think what I'm able to say today is different than had it been standing here about two or three weeks ago. Uh, and I'll come on to that uh, as, as to why. Uh, I think it really fits in terms of politics, process, timescale, and the whole uncertainty around that. Back at the end of March, the UK triggle, triggered the Article 50 mechanism. <coughs> the European Union immediately came back with its outline for negotiations and the three cures, as, as, as Joe's already outlined, in terms of people's finances and the whole issue about the Irish border. Um, and they also said that they needed all that sorted before they then moved into the whole issue about where the UK would fit in within a uh, particularly trade going forward, and that was going to take a uh, significant uh, progress before they entered into those discussions. We have had a UK general election on the 8th of June, and we already have now had a Queen's speech as of a couple of days ago, outlining just exactly where the UK government intend to be over the next couple of, a couple of years in terms of implementing particularly a large number of Brexit-related bills. The EU-UK negotiations started officially on Monday, uh, and you've obviously seen those, uh, those at, a, at a very high level in terms of the, the coverage that they've got. Uh, and of course, uh, the comment was made earlier about stable government, and unfortunately in Northern Ireland we don't have that. Uh, we had a government, it sort of fell by the wayside, they were re-elected, we haven't formed anything, and we have until Thursday of next week to try and form something again. And unfortunately, probably we're hardened politically in terms of our nationalist, unionist lines, uh, as we've seen. Having said that, I suppose the big advantage in all of this, which is going back to my earlier point about why I may be able to say things, things differently now than I would be three weeks ago, is because we now have a minority UK government who are depending on not only our Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, but also a number of Scottish Tory MPs who didn't exist previously. And I think going back to the key issue as to why we're all here in relation to Brexit, that certainly makes things a lot more different than we, in terms of where we're going, rather than where we would have been otherwise had the Conservatives got the landslide majority that initially looked as though that was going to be the case in terms of maybe some more scope for a much softer Brexit than would have been the case otherwise, but then there's the issues about the process around how that would be delivered. That's where we are as of today. In terms of the issues, uh, this time last year, obviously the referendum outcome was known, a uh, bit of a shock to everybody. The EFU, we are criticised as the way we not nail our colours to the mast at the time. It was very clear from discussing it with our membership that there was the complete spectrum of views, and obviously politics came into play as well as just the agri-food industry. Um, so we decided that in the absence of any compelling reason to leave, we advised people to remain, but we recognised that each individual had their, their own uh, right to vote as they saw fit. We then, after the referendum, pulled together our main policy committee chairman, vice chairman, and in July of last year, came up with 10 key goals across four themes. The four themes were trade, support, labour and regulation. Obviously, different uh, elements of those had more or lesser effects in terms of us in the farming industry. If I can just deal with those probably fairly, fairly quickly. In terms of trade, uh, the goals we identified were, sorry, the UK government's goals were that we would be leaving the customs union, but that they wanted a deep and special partnership with Europe going forward, and that was in the Article 50 letter that the Prime Minister uh, wrote. Um, there is a recognition at a European level that, and indeed at a UK level, that the ROI in a border needed to have flexible and imaginative solutions would be required, was the phrase used. Sounds wonderful but that we also recognise that trade would have a major impact on the amount of support that the Northern Ireland agri-food, indeed the UK agri-food industry, would actually require going forward. So it was a starter in all this. In terms of agriculture support, we have depended on the common agricultural policy for the number of years we've been in the European Union. And I think it goes without saying that, to be honest, we have largely depended on both the French and the Irish governments in terms of delivering that support for agriculture going forward. The UK government always made it very clear that the CAP was something that it considered to be a waste of money and that they wanted to do things differently. So we now have a different scenario where we now have to convince the UK government, the UK wider public, 
that we are worth supporting. So in terms of agriculture support, we, we get around about £300 million sterling into the Northern Ireland uh, farming industry every year. Uh, that is guaranteed both this year 2017 and next year 2018 while we're still part of the European Union. We in theory will be lifted by March 2019. We apply for our basic payment scheme as, as, as you folks do down here. Uh, bef uh, after that date, uh, it'll be May of 2019, so we will not have a system to apply to as it stands if we have left the European Union. But immediately after the referendum, the UK government did come out and guarantee the equivalent amount of money for 2019, which would have been the last year of the CAP had we remained in the European Union. But there was a big question mark as to what happened beyond that, but equally the CAP was up for renegotiation anyhow, and it was only guaranteed to 2019. So agriculture is a long-term business, and we always wanted to make sure that we had some degree of certainty going forward. So we were pleased that in the Tory manifesto, just prior to the election, they at least committed to guaranteeing the equivalent amount of support up until the next parliament. At that stage, they thought the next parliament was going to be 2022. It may well be the next parliament could be a lot sooner than that now, but we don't know. Um, but at least it's in there, and they're the only party to really commit to that extent. We have an issue, it's one thing, securing a pot of money and securing it for a number of years going forward. We obviously want to make sure that Northern Ireland maintains its share of that UK pot. Historically, we uh, actually have about 10% of the UK single farm payment, basic payment scheme, and that's based on the fact that we have a lot more small intensive livestock farms which generated the, the, the money from which the, the basic payment scheme was created. Uh, if you look at the Barnet formula, which is how money is generated from Treasury across to the regions of the UK, we only get about 3.3%. So that would be an immediate reduction of almost 66% in terms of that 300 million, 200 million pounds, which is a big chunk of money, bearing in mind, as Joe's rightly pointed out. Without that, we're actually losing money. Even with it, we're losing money. So we need that money going forward for not just Northern Ireland farming, Northern Ireland agri-food industry, but the wider economy and, uh, and rural areas of Northern Ireland as a whole. So we have to recognise that if we do get this pot of money, then it has to be a different delivery system. Uh, the UK government always made it clear the CAP wasn't the right way to go. We ourselves don't necessarily believe it's the right way to go because we feel that it was always moving more and more away from activity in terms of both production activity and environmental activity. And you were basically getting paid just effectively like an income subsidy just to be on the land. So we feel that there is an opportunity to actually move towards a different delivery system. There is an issue about what sort of transition we need going forward and of course as I mentioned earlier about the potential to regionalise within that as we actually have within the CAP at the minute where Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England can all do slight variances along a common theme. We needed to make sure that we didn't actually all have different policies going forward within the UK uh, and obviously our land border with the south of Ireland we've always noticed this, the differences and the impact that would have. Um, so we needed to make sure that there was a UK framework going forward and the discussions ongoing about that and we are pleased to see it in the Queen's speech uh, a few days ago. She did actually refer to the fact that there would be an agriculture bill, um, but again we have to get into the detail of that. So as far as the EFU is concerned, prior to the election there was a very significant amount of activity in terms of developing some sort of future domestic agriculture policy, not just for Northern Ireland but for the UK. We published a document and launched it at our Balmoral show in May have since met with a large number of our both agri-food industry stakeholders and indeed environmental stakeholders, and we're still engaged in those meetings. We're going around our membership starting next week, around uh, meetings in Northern Ireland, just to talk about both this and the whole issue around trade. Uh, and that is very much ongoing, and we will certainly uh, be engaged with our counterparts across in GB in relation to that. Those are the two big ones as far as direct impact on, on the farming industry is concerned. In terms of regulation, this was always a case of just simply uh, f farmers themselves weren't necessarily annoyed at the regulation. They were annoyed about the enforcement of the regulation and the fact that it was linked to their direct subsidies in terms of their basic payment scheme through cross-compliance. And that was the thing that really annoyed them. So it's not necessarily the legislation itself or, in fact, the standards associated with that legislation. Our customers, our supermarket re re uh, customers, actually require higher standards. And I think from our perspective, we see Northern Ireland as a small, flexible region, and we can possibly do things that actually increase our standards. And if we get the proper support for industry going forward, then we can move in that direction. We already have electronic identification in for sheep, and that hopefully gives us some sort of unique selling point, aids traceability, and we're looking at can we do similar type mechanisms going forward. Um, so in terms of legislation, say we didn't necessarily see that there were going to be any change in the standards, but maybe the way that they were linked to that direct support was the critical thing in terms of enforcement. 
uh, that's really the regulation issue. The final one is labour. And it was always recognised that from a farming perspective, unlike our counterparts in Great Britain, who depend at a farm level very heavily on non-British labour, particularly in terms of the vegetable and the fruit sectors, it wasn't as big an issue for the Northern Ireland farming industry. Having said that, it is still an issue, but it certainly is a major concern for our processing industry, who have anything between 30 and 65 per cent of their employees as non-British nationals. Um, so it's very much uh, an important issue and we are pleased to see that obviously this is one of the key things that the UK government are already moving on to try and give certainty, certainty to those, that labour force that they are wanted uh, and that we don't necessarily want to, 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 to remove them from the UK. Um, so if you like, those are the, the very broad issues. In terms of trade specifically, which I know is the whole issue about the North-South situation, um, obviously, as Joe's already point, pointed out, there's milk comes south, there's beef comes north, there's pigs comes north, there's uh, sorry, there's lambs go south, and we are very heavily integrated in terms of movement back and forward across the border. Um, we, at the outset, as an organisation, as part of our ten key goals, identified that we wanted to maintain access to the European markets, uh, and also that we wanted to ensure, ensure that there was minimum disruption between Northern Ireland and the South of Ireland in terms of that trade. Uh, we did, however, also want to see if we could secure additional markets outside the European Union, but we can go back to that later on in, in discussion. Um, we did also stress the importance of making sure that standards were not undermined um, and the whole issue about the external tariff in terms of not only just the actual amount of money, but the standards that have been met. I think that's critical going forward um, because you don't want to be undermined by lower, pro lower, st lower standard product. So uh, in terms of specifics around trade, uh, Northern Ireland has a small region, um, but uh, the agri-food industry is important. Uh, we have grown our output in terms of our uh, uh, um, sales over this last while. Uh, we've increased that by 42% in terms of what remains in Northern Ireland. Um, we have also seen our growth to the south of Ireland increase by, uh, so it's over doubled uh, between the, over the last 10 years. Um, but nonetheless, when we look at the actual hard figures, um, there's only somewhere in the region of um, milk and beef in particular where there's issues about uh, product coming, or sorry, milk in particular with, with product coming, going to the south of Ireland is probably the key issue going forward. At a UK level, we're not self-sufficient in indigenous products. Primarily, um, the latest figures we have show that in pork, the UK is only 55% self-sufficient, beef 75, lamb 92%, poultry 73%, butter 75, cream 95, yogurt 75, cheese 55, milk powders. We don't do a big run that in the UK, so it's 200% self-sufficient, but that goes elsewhere. So the UK is not self-sufficient in what it needs for its consumers, and obviously the UK population continues to grow. The actual trade imbalance that the UK have, and particularly the meat products, uh, there's somewhere in the region of a £1.6 billion annual gap for poultry, poultry meat, an £800 million gap for beef and lamb, a £600 million import gap for dairy products, and a £1 billion gap for pig meat. That's annual. So there's very huge gaps in terms of self-sufficiency and the imports versus exports. That's really as much as I want to say at this stage. I hope I have whetted your appetite for a bit of discussion later on. And uh, certainly we are very keen that over the next few years, we try and make inroads into making sure that we have uh, maintained as much of the status quo as we possibly can do. And I think that's where we're all on at this particular stage. So thank you very much indeed.